The adapter pattern is a structural design pattern that allows us to convert a class's interface to some other kind of interface or abstract class that we depend on in our application. And this is extremely useful if we're dealing with third-party libraries because those libraries don't usually use the interfaces that are currently defined in our application. So we have to adapt those classes in the third-party library to whatever interfaces that we depend on through our own application. And this is one of those patterns that's pretty common, extremely useful, so you might actually be using this pattern without even knowing it. Anyways, speaking of third-party libraries, that is exactly what we're going to base this demo off of. So I currently have this iProduct repository, just a simple repository for my product model. So you can get a product by ID, you can create a product, and currently I implement this with an in-memory product repository that just acts on a list. Well, in-memory isn't good enough for me. I want to actually persist my products outside of my application. So that being said, we're going to store the products in a database. And to do that, we are going to quickly set up NED Framework. This isn't an NED Framework tutorial, so this is going to be an extremely fast setup. Let's just get NED Framework Core. Here we go, Microsoft.NED Framework Core. Install that. And for this tutorial, I'm just going to use the in-memory provider which is kind of funny because I'm replacing my in-memory product repository, but we're still going to be using an in-memory database. But that's no big deal, we can easily change that later. So for NAD Framework, of course, I need a DB context, so I will set up a product DB context here in my services and just inherit from DB context. Generate a constructor so that we can take in some DB context options, and we'll use these options to configure the in-memory provider. And most importantly, I need a DB set for the products that I want to store in the database. So just the DB set for product, we'll call this products and import product from our model. Awesome, so I have my DB context and many people believe that a DB context, you know, is really like a repository. We can create products, query products all through this products DB set on the DB context. And it does all the mapping between our objects and the database. So I'm cool with that. I'm gonna use the DB context as my product repository. So let's get that product DB context here in my program.cs. Just instantiate that. We're going to need some options too. So let's get a DB context options going up here. And the easiest way to do that is with a new DB context options builder. Let's import everything we need. And we can use in memory database, which is what we want to do. For this example, we can always switch to a different database if we wanted to. And we'll call this products. And then we have to get the options from this builder. So we can just use the options property. And finally, pass in the options. So I have my product DB context, which I want to use as my product repository. So, all right, no big deal. Here we go. The I product repository is going to be a product DB context. But of course, that makes no sense because the product DB context doesn't implement my I product repository interface. So we need to adapt the product DB context to some kind of class that implements the I product repository. So we're going to create a new product repository over here, and this is going to be the database product repository. And let's implement the iProduct repository interface, make these async. And what are we trying to adapt to this iProduct repository? Well, that is the product DB context. So that means we're going to get the product DB context inside of this class. So let's get that in a field, we'll just call that context, and we'll get that through the constructor. So this is what we're trying to adapt to the iProduct repository, so obviously we need that in the class. And now, we can use that context to implement these iProduct repository methods. So if we're creating, we can just add the product to our DB context, and then call save changes async, we'll have to await that. And then for getting a product by ID, very simple with the DB context, we can just get into our products DB set and do a find async. We can use find async because the primary key is the product ID, so we can just pass that in, and this has to be async await as well, so we will await the find async, and there we go, we have implemented our iProduct repository interface with a database product repository that ultimately adapts a product DB context to this interface. So now back in the program.cs, we can wrap this context in a new database product repository, pass in the context, and now we have adapted the context to our interface that we need in our application when we run this, because this does indeed take an iProduct repository. I didn't even demo the application when we started, but all it does is we create a new product, 
and then we just query it from our repository and write it to the console. So here the final output was shoes for $129.99. Another thing that is nice about adapting the product DB context to this interface is that to support a database product repository and integrating with our DB context, we didn't have to change what our run method took in as a parameter. It's always just going to require an I product repository. We didn't have to change this to a product DB context. And that being said, it'll be pretty easy if we want to switch back to the in memory product repository, just change what we instantiate for the I product repository interface that we pass in to this method. So like all design patterns should, it just grants us additional flexibility, and we've also gracefully extended our application. All right, so I wanted to take this a step further because if we look at our database product repository, this repository and this adapting actually does a lot of work. So for creating, we have to add the product to the DB context and then save the changes. So, all right, maybe not a lot of work, but a little bit extra work. And then I guess get by ID is actually pretty simple too. But anyways, I wanted to show off that adapters don't really have to be that complex. So for my next example, I'm now using this iProduct writer for my run method. And right now I just have a console product writer. And all we do is at the end of our run method, we write our product using the product writer. So in this case, it's going to write it to the console. So if we look at that, just the console our write line. Now, maybe I want to write my product to a file. Well, I already have this file writer that I added over here. And all this does is take in a file path and some content and then we use system.io.file to do that writing. So this is also kind of an adapter. I didn't really mean to do this, but we kind of adapt this write all text async method to our file writer class. So we are just adapting everywhere. But anyways, I want to write my product to a file. So maybe in my program.cs, you know, I would want a file writer. Let's actually import this namespace. This isn't going to work because the file writer doesn't implement the I product writer interface. And in fact, this method signature doesn't even match the required I product writer method. So same thing as before, going to have to adapt the file writer to some kind of I product writer that'll use this file writer so we can write our product to a file. So let's do that. Let's create a new class to do that adapting. This will be the file product writer. So let's implement that I product writer interface. And we want a file writer inside of this class because that is what we're trying to adapt to this interface. So we'll get that through the constructor. And now writing a product, quite simply, all we have to do is take our writer and call the write method. And oh, we need a file path. So how are we going to get a file path? Because this write product method doesn't take in a file path. How are we going to do that? We'll think about that in a second. But anyways, the content we want to write is just the product to string. And we have to await this and make this method async as well. All right, but we still need this file path. And you might be thinking, you know, we just cannot do this adapting at all because this file writer just doesn't take the same parameters as our write product method. And if that is the case, that's no big deal because we have a constructor where we can get a file path. So we can get the file path through the constructor, generate a field for that, and now we can simply pass in the file path to the write method. And this makes sense because when we use this I product writer in our program.cs, it's not like we ask for a file path here anyways, so we couldn't pass one into the write product method, which makes sense because the I product writer might not be a file product writer. It might be a console product writer. So there'd be no reason to ask for a file path. So we'll just get it through the constructor and then pass in that file path when we actually call the method. So now back in our program.cs, let's adapt this file writer to a new file product writer. And then we have to pass in a file path that we will want to write our products to. So we'll just call this products.txt. So I think my whole idea behind going into the I product writer and showing off an adapter that way was originally to show that adapters don't really have to be complex, which is kind of true. This adapter isn't that complex. But another lesson from that is that don't forget that you can take in any parameters that you might need later inside of your constructor. But anyways, let's now run this with our database product repository adapter and our file product writer adapter. All right, so we get nothing output to the console, but we should have a products.txt. And that should be down here in the bin. Here we go, products.txt. And there is my product written to this file. So there we go, we have successfully implemented the adapter pattern twice, in fact. And as a result, we have gracefully integrated NAD framework and a system.io.file into our application by adapting them 
to the interfaces that we depend on in our application, specifically in this run method. And by depending on these interfaces, we can always go back to our in-memory product repository or console product writer. So this pattern has allowed us to stay flexible in our application. So hopefully you can use this in your own application. If you have any questions, criticisms, or concerns, be sure to leave them below in the comment section. Other than that, leave a like or subscribe for more. Thank you.